I'm Dave. I'm from Toronto. And I'm talking about universal web design. So I saw on Twitter somebody requested a hashtag for each talk. So this is, oh, that was you? OK, it was a cool idea. I've never done that before, so kudos. Uh, so here's the hashtag, UWD, for universal web design. Um, if you have anything interesting to say, I'll check it after the talk and uh, respond, probably, as long as it's appropriate. Um, so let's start off by talking about what universal design is. Um, this is a quote from um, a guy named Ronald L. Mace. He's an architect. And he, according to some people, coined the term universal design. Uh, but regardless of whether he coined the term or not, he was one of the pioneers and very important in the field. Um, so he said that universal design is the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible. And that products and environments there is kind of key because this started off as something for the built environment, for architecture and uh, spaces in the real world and industrial design. And that's where it's sort of really taken off. Um, back in the 50s, as um, design started being more inclusive to people with disabilities, this, uh, we started to see some of this come out. And even though design started including people with disabilities, often they were segregated, separate from overall design considerations. Uh, there's this concept of barrier-free designs, of removing barriers for people with disabilities, but it wasn't necessarily thought of during the overall design process, so it was kind of tacked on. Through the 60s, though, um, you, we started to see these accessible design concepts, and that term started to come into favor too, accessible design, uh, start to be integrated into overall design process and architecture. And by the mid-70s, the disability rights movement started to gain some ground and argue for more inclusive design, and more equality. And it was around this time that another architect, uh, Michael Bednar, uh, suggested using the term universal design, so he's the other person that some people claim invented the term. Um, suggested using the term universal design to refer to the idea that removing barriers benefits everybody, not just people with disabilities, but every single person. Um, then universal design kind of grew in popularity for the 80s and 90s, and now it's uh, heavily promoted and used by a number of institutions around the world. Some of the concepts from universal design have been integrated into laws and regulations and guidelines. Uh, so it's really kind of taken off and matured as a set of concepts. So let's look at some of the successes of universal design. One of the ones that people talk about most often is curb cuts. So when you're walking along the sidewalk and the curb kind of dips like this. Um, most people take these for granted. You probably don't think about them very often. And I'm guessing that the last time you did think about it was when it wasn't there and when you needed it. The whole point is that it removes a barrier and we don't really think of it until that barrier comes back and affects what we're trying to do. So that's a sign of good design, that this is something that just kind of works for us that we don't think about too often. And certainly this is very helpful for people with disabilities in wheelchairs or with other mobility problems. But it's helpful for everybody. If you're a uh, parent pushing a stroller, if you have a grocery cart or a wheeled suitcase, this is going to be incredibly useful. Or if you're on a bike or a scooter or roller skates, um, or if you're just really into something on your phone and not paying attention to what you're doing, you don't want to trip on the curb and you know do a faceplant on the sidewalk, this can help you. Um, so that's a really good example of something that benefits people with disabilities, maybe most, but everybody can make use of it, get something out of a design like this. Here's another example. Um, so this is uh, railings, both on both sides of a ramp and then on both sides of a staircase. Um, as somebody from Canada, I have to deal with winter for far longer in the year than I want to think about right now. And if surfaces are snowy or icy, or even just wet from the rain, handrails are really important. Um, or if you're carrying something or a little bit off balance, or say you've had a lot to drink, Handrails come in really handy for everybody. So again, it's something that can benefit somebody with a mobility issue most, but everybody's going to get a lot of use out of it. And as a final example, this is the Guggenheim Museum in New York. And these different levels that you see aren't separate floors in the building. The building is actually a spiral with sort of a big ramp that just goes the whole length top or bottom to top. So when 
you're walking through it, you never have to go upstairs or use an elevator or escalator. And the grade of the ramp, the slope, is uh, pretty small. And it's actually well within most guidelines for wheelchair ramps. So if you're somebody in a wheelchair or with other mobility issues, you can use this museum without ever having to struggle to get upstairs or wait for an elevator or anything like that. So it's great for that. But if you're an able-bodied user walking through the museum, you also don't have to wait for elevators or interrupt your art viewing experience to head off to the side to use an escalator. So everybody, again, benefits here. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about with universal design. And these architectural built space examples are kind of emblematic of, of what's been done historically. So let's talk about the web then. Um, as web designers and developers, we often think we're radicals and forging new ground and you know solving all these new problems. But most of the problems that we're solving have already been dealt with before in other areas. So as long as people have been creating things, they've had these problems. And usually the solutions they've come up with can be applied to the web. So I want to look at how these universal design solutions and principles can be applied to what we're doing on the web. Um, part two, why should we care? I hope you're not asking this because you're here, but sometimes you aren't the one making the decisions, right? You have bosses and stakeholders who might say, well, this stuff's not important, it's a nice to have, we can tack it on at the end of the project. But that almost never works, it's usually a bad idea. So let's look at some reasons why you or your bosses or stakeholders might want to care about this early in the process and think about it throughout the entire project. So hopefully the first question that you ask when you're starting a new project is why we're even building this website? Why do we have this? Um, I think I would argue that there's three basic reasons people build websites. First is money. Um, you, it might be a direct thing. You might be selling a product. Or it might be indirect. You might be advertising a product or collecting ad revenue. But regardless, money is often a huge driving force between, or behind creating websites. Uh, the second one is just because you want to share knowledge. So something like Wikipedia doesn't earn money, it's just there to serve a service, to share information about the world and help people learn new things. And then the last is to build a community. So there's lots of band sites out there for bands or TV shows or whatever that aren't really aimed at sharing information or making money, they're just there to build a space where people can hang out with their buds and chat about stuff that they like. Now most websites are going to have some combination of these three things in varying, varying degrees. But the, the common element of all of these is that the design, uh, the point of having the website is to get eyeballs on it, to get people looking at your site, or more accurately, to get people using your site. The more clicks and page loads and views you have, the more successful your site is. And a site that isn't used by anybody is just kind of sad, and it's probably going to fade away or disappear when the domain name expires. And more than just using the site or going there, we want people to enjoy using it. We want them to be happy and uh, you know, excited to go there and to come back. So just like you have a goal in creating your site, one of those three things I just talked about, your users are going to have some goal in visiting your site. And we want them to be able to achieve their goal and achieve it quickly so that they're very happy. So if we have goals that include making our users happy, and if our users have goals, it's important to understand who our users are in order to help them achieve those goals. Um, most designers and developers build things essentially for themselves. It's not always a bad thing. It's very helpful to imagine yourself using a product or a site so that you can understand some of the issues that might come up and use cases. But it's important to, to take a step back at some point and remember that you are not your user. Your users are going to have very different ideas and thoughts that they're bringing to the table. They're going to have different goals than you and experiences. If something goes wrong, they're probably going to have a lot less information about how to solve a problem than you do as the person that created the site. So we need to keep the user in mind when we're building and not just build it for ourselves. It's also super or important to remember that users are diverse. Um, if you take nothing else home from this presentation, this is kind of the key thing to remember, that users are very different. 
Uh, they differ in physical ability and ideas and values. They differ in the languages they speak and understand, in socioeconomic status and the technology that they're using to access your site. Um, they're all unique in ways that we can predict and probably in lots of ways we can't predict and shouldn't even bother trying. So I've, I've mentioned accessibility a lot and disability a lot so far. I want to highlight this article, uh, An Alphabet of Accessibility Issues by Ann Gibson. So this came out on Pastry Box about a year ago, and in it she describes 26 real people that she knows that have accessibility issues that wouldn't necessarily fit into what we can, would consider a disabled user or you know somebody that normally gets talked about in terms of accessibility on the web. It's a really good article. I recommend reading all of it. And uh, by the way, I'll post all the slides online so you can go get links and everything to it after the fact. Um, but I just want to highlight a few of the 26 people that she mentions and read uh, their descriptions to you. So the first one is, B fell down a hill while running to close his car windows in the rain and fractured multiple fingers. He's trying to surf the web with his left hand and the keyboard. G was diagnosed with dyslexia at an early age. He prefers books to the internet because books tend to have better text and spacing for reading. <coughs> H is a fluent English speaker, but hasn't been in America long. She's frequently tripped up by American cultural idioms and phrases. She needs websites to be simple and readable, even when the concept is complex. J doesn't know that he's developed an astigmatism in his right eye. He does know that by the end of the day, he has a lot of trouble reading the screen, so he zooms in the web browser to 150% after 7 p.m. Z doesn't have what you would consider a disability. He has twins under the age of one. He's a stay-at-home dad who has a grabby child in one arm, and if he's lucky, one or two fingers free on the other hand to navigate his iPad. So these are all people that aren't maybe your prototypical person with a disability or accessibility user, but they all have issues that are going to be impacting how they use the web. This is a chart from the US Census Bureau showing how the population of the United States is going to age over the next 35 years. Um, the article I just mentioned cites Robin Christofferson pointing out that many of us are only temporarily able-bodied. We might be in crappy lighting conditions, or we might have broken headphones, or we might get sick, or hopefully we're all going to age. And when we age, that's going to bring a whole host of accessibility issues along with it. We're going to, our eyesight's going to get worse. We're going to have joint problems and issues with the mouse. And as you can see, the population of people over 65 is expected to increase fairly dramatically over the next 35 years. So we're going to have more and more users who are dealing with these issues from trying to use the web. So that's a lot about diversity of people, but diversity isn't just people's ability, we also have diversity in how people access the web. So this is an illustration of 18,000 Android devices that were on the market as of August 2014, so a year ago pretty much. Uh, it does not include iOS, Android, or sorry, iOS, Windows, Blackberry, it's just Android, and it's insane. There's, there's a lot of them. They all have different specs, screen sizes, capabilities. And because users are accessing our stuff from all these different devices with all these different capabilities and screen sizes, we can't make assumptions about how they're going to be viewing our content or consuming our content. Um, we can't tell them that, oh, well, you have to use this device, or it doesn't work if you use this, you're doing it wrong. It's just not fair. Mobile's a you know, it's a big category and a convenient category. So this is some data from Pew Research Center from this year, um, or sorry, from 2013. No, 2014, I apologize. Uh, anyway, saying 64% of Americans have used a smartphone to access the internet, or a cell phone to access the internet. And data from the year before in 2013 showed that 34% of Americans actually used a phone as their primary or only way to access the internet. So if we're talking about people accessing the internet using a phone, it's not just device capability that we have to worry about, screen size that we have to worry about, it's also connection speed. In the US, in major metropolitan centers, we're generally lucky that we have 4G speeds, you know, this LTE stuff that's very fast. But this data from OpenSignal from 2014 shows that LTE coverage 
it's okay, but it's also it's not great. There's still a lot of people that are accessing uh, the web from sub LTE speeds, so presumably 3G. And on a slow connection like that, huge websites can be a real problem. What about outside the US? Uh, this is a screenshot I took while I was in Paris, which is a big metropolitan center. You'd think, oh, they must have great internet. But the whole time I kept seeing this big E in the corner for an edge connection, a 2G connection, which basically made it impossible to load many of the websites that I was trying to load. Um, so connection speed is diverse, and it can be very problematic if your site is huge. And it also, if we have big sites, we have to worry about how much these connections, these mobile uh, data plants are costing people. Mobile data isn't cheap, especially once you get outside the US. The US does pretty well on this chart, uh, which is from Canada. But once you get outside the United States, um, it co can cost a lot of money to get a mobile data plan. I mean, if you look at Mexico, it takes basically 34 hours of work at minimum wage to get a 500 megabyte plan. Now, the average web page right now is just over 2 megabytes, so that means you'd have to work 34 hours to view 250 websites, which is insane to me, but that's, that's where we're at. So that's, that's diversity. Um, besides all the feel-goodery associated with saying that every human is important and, and we care about each person, which we do, and it, it's true, there's also legitimate business reasons why we want to consider all users to be important, why we want to embrace this diversity. There's a reason customer satisfaction and user experience is so important in the business world, because if you treat somebody right, they can become your biggest ally. If you treat somebody wrong, they can become your worst enemy. Um, for every group you decide not to support, you're cutting into your profit. Rather than splitting people into these chunks that you're going to either include or exclude, it's probably easier in the long run, probably going to save you money in the long run to just be inclusive to everybody and give everybody a really good experience. So if users are diverse, and if we care about every user, which we do, the way that we reach them all is to design with empathy. And I've been really happy to see so far during the conference a lot of people talking about empathy and building things with empathy. Because in my opinion, that's the best way to build a good product. Um, we need to think about how our choices affect our potential users. So hopefully you care now, and your bosses care, and your stakeholders care. So what do you do about it? Um, universal design has these seven uh, concepts, these seven principles. And when I read these, I was struck by how similar they were to what we think about when we do stuff on the web. Now these were written for build spaces and environment, as I talked about, but the fact is they're just good design principles, and so that's why they apply so well to the web. So I'm going to go through each of these, and they each have some guidelines associated with them. Uh, I'll call some of them out specifically and talk about how, they, how we can apply it to what we're doing on the web. So the first one is equitable use, which means that the design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. So I've kind of talked about that a lot. Um, there's a number of guidelines associated with this. Provide the same means of use for all users, identical whenever possible, equivalent when not. Avoid segregating or stigmatizing any users. Uh, provisions for privacy, security, and safety should be equally available to all users. Make the design appealing to all users. Basically, what you want to do is just Make one website that's great. Don't make a mobile M dot site that you redirect mobile users to. Don't have a link for your accessible version or text only version. Don't have your low bandwidth version that you direct people to. Just make one website that doesn't suck and it's going to help all your users. Um, the next one is flexibility and use, which means that the design accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. So this is kind of what I was talking about with different devices and people coming out with the browser of their choice or the device of their choice. We don't want to lock them in and say, well, this website's best viewed in Chrome or IE8 not supported. Um, that can be tempting, but you know, if, if you're a user who's maybe stuck in a large organization with IE8 and you have no choice, that's going to be off-putting and you're going to lose that person's business. It's slightly difficult to include everybody, but we want to try to respect the choices 
that people have made or that others have made for them. The next one is simple or intuitive, which means that the use of the design is easy to understand, regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. So one of the guidelines is to eliminate unnecessary complexity. This is a very good design guideline, no matter what you're doing. It works for visual design, it works for our content and information architecture, and even our code. Keep things simple. Another guideline is to be consistent. Uh, user expectations and intuition. Again, this applies everywhere. Keep things consistent, helps everybody out. And the next guideline is to accommodate a wide range of literacy and language skills. So literacy and language skills obviously have to do with our content, but it also has to do with computer literacy. Not every user is gonna be an expert computer user or come at the site with the same knowledge that we have. So we have to keep that in mind. Lots of users don't know what a hamburger menu icon is, so you know maybe throw the word menu in there, throw them a bone. Uh, and I already mentioned in that alphabet of accessibility issues article the whole thing with language. Even if somebody is maybe a PhD and has a really high, uh, you know, cognitive ability, they might not be a native English speaker. So keep your language simple to help everybody out. The next. Uh, thing is perceptible information. The design communicates necessary information effectively to the user, regardless of ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. And some of the guidelines are to provide different modes of presentation for information. So for this, if you have an image, throw some alt text in there. If you have a video, do some closed captioning and a transcript and a descriptive video audio track. Make it available to people even if they don't have their headphones or they're deaf or they're blind give them a way to consume your content. If you have a PDF, do a text or an HTML version. Because PDFs can be really hard to download on a slow connection, and they can be pretty inaccessible a lot of the time. Another guideline is to provide adequate con contrast and maximize legibility. So this would be highlighting your important information, so visual contrast in terms of spacing and uh, font size and stuff like that, but also color contrast. Uh, if you have you know, light gray text on a white background, that's gonna be really hard for somebody to read, especially if they have low vision or if they're colorblind or if they're in the bright sun. There's lots of color contrast ratio checkers online, so you can check those out and make sure that your background and foreground are distinct enough. And uh, a last guideline for this one is provide compatibility with a variety of techniques or devices used by people with sensory limitations, basically support assistive technologies. Make sure your website works with a screen reader or a braille printer and that it's accessible. Uh, the next principle is tolerance for error. The design minimizes hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. And for this, we basically want to provide warnings for users and fail safe features. So if something goes wrong, you explain really well what went wrong and what they can do about it. And you provide fallbacks if something doesn't work. Make sure that they can always access your content even when things break. Next principle is low physical effort. The design can be used efficiently and comfortably and with a minimum of fatigue. And for this, we want to minimize repetitive actions and sustain physical effort. Try to reduce the number of clicks to get to your important content. Try to reduce the amount of scrolling users have to do. Pay attention to eye fatigue. So the color contrast is going to come back in there for that. And so is stuff like animations. If you have a lot of stuff going on on the screen, that might give people headaches, induce a seizure. Uh, there's lots of things that can happen, so just be careful with it. And finally, the last principle doesn't have a huge bearing on what we do for the web. It's size and space uh, for approach and use, which means that appropriate size and space is provided for approach, reach, manipulation, and use regardless of user's body size, posture, or mobility. This is really mostly dealing with the physical world. But it's still important to keep in mind. It might mean having a little bit more web, uh, white space on your site, or just keep in mind users who might have issues with this. OK, so the next thing I want to talk about is PAPER, which is an acronym. Because remembering four things is easier than remembering those seven things. <laughs> I certainly have no ability to remember the seven things that I just went over. So this is what I ended up using for projects. Paper stands for performance, accessibility, progressive enhancement, and responsive web design. These are the things that I keep in mind on every project that I'm building to make sure that I give a great experience to all our users. 
Um, a lot of people are working on this stuff on the web, which means they're working on universal design stuff without even realizing it. So there's lots of great resources already out there for these things. I encourage you to just Google them. You will find quite a bit of great information. Basically, performance is when we want to deliver a great experience to all our users, regardless of their connection. Accessibility is when we want to deliver a great experience to all our users, regardless of their ability. Progressive enhancement is when we want to give a great experience, regardless of a browser's ability. And responsive web design is when we want to give a great experience, regardless of viewing context. So these things all intersect, obviously. And at the center, we get our universal web design. This is what we've been talking about. So keeping these things in mind is how, on the web, we give a great experience to all users. So let's talk about even more tips, some actual specific things that you can do on your websites to help with these four things, or with the seven things I've talked about before, if that's your, your thing. So tip number one, render content server side. Um, this is really the basis of progressive enhancement. Um, if you aren't rendering your content server side, then it might not be there for your user. You want to make sure your content's there for your user no matter what even if they manage to only get one request through, which is for the HTML. And then if everything else breaks, no JavaScript, no CSS, at least they get something. How many of you have been to a site and seen this? Or this? <laughs> uh, it can be incredibly frustrating, but it's fairly common with modern web apps built on MVC frameworks. Uh, Scott Gell at Filament Group has this quote that MVC stands for maybe Google Content. Um, sorry. So, I mean, it doesn't mean we shouldn't use MVC frameworks. They're obviously super useful. They're great for a lot of contexts. But what we want to do is progressively enhance our content. Load all your content server side. Make sure it's there for every user, no matter what. And then build on top of that with your MVC framework to give everybody a really good experience. Um, at gov.uk, the UK government site, they did some research and found that 1.1% of their users weren't able to load or process JavaScript. Now, a small minority of those 1.1% were because the user actually had JavaScript turned off. The rest is because there's some problem. So there was maybe a conflicting plugin in their browser, or some issue with a third-party ad network, or something like that. But the point is 1.1%, which is actually a fairly large number of users to a government site, weren't getting any JavaScript loaded. So if your site is completely uh, requiring JavaScript to load any content, they're going to get this, which is bad. The next tip is to use semantic markup. Um, if you use markup, if you use HTML the way it was intended, you get a lot of benefits right out of the box. You get accessibility benefits because the browsers all know all the different uh, accessibility features that are associated with each element. It reduces the chance of rendering errors or unexpected bugs. In cases where CSS or JavaScript aren't loaded, you get default styles that kind of make sense. And it allows, um, or sorry, it helps with uh, SEO, search, search engine optimization. So what you don't want to do is something like this. And I'm sure you've either seen this or done this before, where you have a link that doesn't really link anywhere, and you give it a class button and make it look like a button, but really it's just a link. This is a bad idea. A link goes somewhere and a button does something. To a screen reader user, this will just be, like this will get announced as a link to them. They won't see this as a button, um, even if you've styled it as one. If JavaScript is broken, this isn't going to do anything. This is going to link, like scroll the user back up to the top of the page. So it introduces barriers that we can easily remove by using the proper HTML element. Instead, you can do something like this. If you have a link to a file, just use a link to the file. If you have a button, use the button element. Or better yet, if you have a button that requires JavaScript, have some sort of fallback, and then have JavaScript render this so it only gets put on the page if JavaScript is available and working. One of the most common ways that uh, users using assistive technologies like screen readers navigate pages is with headings. And they use the heading structure to skip around and to help understand the structure of the page. So if you skip a heading level, like here, how H2 is skipped, it's going to be very disorienting, and they'll potentially lose their place, 
or get confused at least momentarily. So it's better to do this, use the proper order of headings to structure your page. It's simple, you can style them with CSS, there's no reason you, know, you need to do this just for the font size thing. Do this and make the fonts a little different if you need to. The other thing about headings is that the HTML5 document outline with headings is a total lie. So I don't know if you've um, seen stuff like this where the spec says you can do, you know, H1's all over the place. If you have a new sectioning element, you can throw an H1 in there and it'll just figure it out. No browser supports the HTML5 document outline. It's a complete, I don't want to say farce. No, I do want to say farce. It's a complete farce. Um, so instead of doing something like this where your users with assistive technology are just going to be told everything's in H1 and they won't understand the structure of the page, use the proper order for the headings build your page out that way. The next tip is to detect features. Uh, so look at, and see what the browser can do. And if it supports something, then do it. Don't just assume the browser can do everything you want. This doesn't mean user agent sniffing. User agents are dangerous. Uh, they, browsers specifically write user agents to be confusing and to trip you up because they don't want you using user agents either. Um, what we want to do instead is use a library like Modernizer to detect what the browser can do and then progressively enhance. If a browser doesn't support a feature, we have a fallback. If it does, then we throw that nice thing at it. The next thing we want to do is cut the mustard. Is anybody here familiar with this term in a web context? No, okay. Um, so the BBC News on their site, they have a lot of great responsive web design resources came up with this term, cut the mustard. And the idea is that you want to build uh, two or a few different versions of the page based on that feature detection, based on what the browser supports. So you have like a really basic version, and then if the browser supports certain key features, if it cuts the mustard, then we give it a fancier version. So I like to think of it, uh, or I like to do three different versions. The first is just the oh crap version, where you just get that one request through and nothing else works just basic HTML, no CSS and JavaScript. So this means structuring your HTML properly, using elements semantically, having good structure based on the content, not based on design. Uh, so this is what it would look like. This is actually a bad example. I probably should have used a good example, but whatever. This is Vogue.com. Uh, so this is what we don't want to do. Like there's a bunch of weird markup that somehow is getting rendered here that doesn't make any sense. The navigation is very confusing. That's what you want to avoid. You want to have a very clear layout in your HTML if no JavaScript or CSS is getting rendered. And then it'll also help the like one person in the entire United States who's using links, the text-based browser. But I mean, we don't really care about that person in general. Um, the next version is sort of the basic version, the really simple H or CSS, maybe CSS1, uh, no JavaScript or minimal JavaScript. And that's for stuff like this, Internet Explorer 8 or 6, whatever. So if the browser supports very basic things like loading CSS and running some basic JavaScript, then it gets an OK version. You know, simple text-based layout, nothing too fancy, but it works, the content's there. And then for a browser that supports a lot of new stuff, we give it like the fancy stuff with all the things we care about. You know, the one that we show our stakeholders when we show like the prototypical version of our site. So to do that, you want to do something like this. You just throw a little bit of JavaScript in uh, the bottom of the page or maybe in the header. You say if query selector is supported and local storage is supported and add event listener is supported, then we load a bunch of junk. We load our CSS and JavaScript that are specifically for this fancy version. Uh, and the reason we do it like this is because we don't want to throw all that CSS and JavaScript at a user that's not going to use it. We don't want to make them download those files if they don't need to. Um, and you can use whatever you know, functions or features you need to here, but the point is you're checking for the stuff you need, and if it's supported, then you load stuff. And there's these two great libraries from the Filament group again, uh, called Load.js and Load CSS that are really handy in scenarios like this. So what you do is you just stick them in there and load your CSS and JS files conditionally. The next tip is to test a lot. Test everything. There's a lot of automated tests you can do to pick up low-hanging fruit, solve easy problems that are hopefully just mistakes that you've overlooked, not like actual things you've neglected. So the W3C has HTML validator, and they actually have a new one 
uh, called the new HTML validator, clever name. Um, there's APIs for this stuff, so you can build it in, or so it's built into things like run tasks and uh, CIs and stuff like that. They also just yesterday or the day before, I think, released this mobile checker that will in, uh, search your site for mobile issues or mobile usability issues, which is really handy. Google has PageSpeed Insights, which will do the same thing. It'll find mobile usability issues, but it'll also check mobile performance and desktop performance for you and give you tips about things you can fix on your site. Web page test is like the king of uh, performance testing. It lets you choose different browsers and connection speeds and locations to test from. It gives you a ton of information back about the performance of your site including um, film strip views and videos of the page loading so you can see exactly how long it takes before content becomes visible and where breakdowns are. There's this site called whatdoesmysitecost.com which is a really cool thing that shows you how much money it costs in different countries to actually load your page. So uh, before I had that HTML up from vogue.com, I threw vogue.com in here as well. It was an 8 megabyte homepage and it cost $2.52 to load from the uh, country of Vanuatu. So if you're there and you're interested in fashion, you're going to be paying a lot of money to go to the Vogue website. Um, so it's interesting if you have a heavy page to see what it's actually costing your users in terms of real money. And then uh, the last automated testing thing I want to talk about is Tenon. This is a paid service, so keep that in mind, but it's an accessibility checker and it's really good. So their focus is on um, making, like being certain of everything that they tell you, not just saying, well, maybe there's a problem here. If they report an issue, it's because it's a real issue. And it'll give you links to resources, uh, guidelines that um, for each issue that comes up. So automated testing is great, but it's only going to get you part of the way there. So what you want to do is real manual testing, open up a browser, and make sure stuff works. This, these paper things that I talked about can interact in weird ways, and the only way to really see that is to do testing yourself. So this is one example where I loaded this Vogue website up with Apple's voiceover turned on the um, screen reader. And so this down in the, the bottom right corner, my right, your left, um, is what voiceover is reading out. So right now it's saying 90% loaded. Now, I, as a sighted user, can see what's going on on the site. I can start consuming this content and read what's there. But the voiceover user is just hearing 90% loaded for like a few seconds after this. So it's a case where they're getting a worse experience because of um, the combination of the site's poor performance and the fact that they're an assistive technology user. I, as a sighted user, get to consume that content those few seconds earlier than the screen reader user does. So it's an example of something that you wouldn't necessarily pick up on until you open up a browser and start testing. One great tool for manual testing is Browser Sync. It lets you hook up a bunch of devices and browsers together and load a site on all of them at once. And then one thing, if you do something in one browser, it will happen in all the others. So if you scroll in one, they'll all scroll. If you click in one, they'll all get the click event. So it's a cool way to see how things break cross browser and cross device. Um, nothing beats using real devices, so check out an open device lab. There's actually one here in Portland that I have not had a chance to check out yet, but I'm hoping to before I go, called Mobile Portland, and they have a bunch of devices that you can go and use and test your stuff on, and it's all free. And finally, if you don't have access to a real browser, a real device um, to test, there's, there are tools like Browser Stack out there where you can load up emulators or remote connections to other types of computers and browsers to test your stuff. So that's a great tool too. Next tip is to listen to your users and listen to people that aren't your users too. Um, set up an email communication channel. And then once email communication is set up, read those emails. Don't just let them go into a box that's ignored. And answer those emails. Follow up with questions. Um, you'll learn things about what your users are trying to do and what obstacles they're having. Run focus groups and interviews with users and again people that aren't your users and find out what their obstacles are, what their problems are, and what's working well so you can keep doing it. And the last thing is just to remove barriers. So I started 
this talk talking about the barrier-free movement and barrier-free design in the uh, real world. And while we're no longer talking about physical barriers, it's important to remember that users still have obstacles, and what we want to do is try to remove those, get them out of the way. Basically, we want to make things easier for our users, even if it's a little bit harder for us. We want to take that burden off. Thanks.